right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys today. How many of you are enjoying your summer so far? Anybody? Four people. Cool. Let's see if anybody online or at the other location isn't enjoying their summer. Let's say hello to our south location and everybody at the vacation campus. Come on. We're so grateful that you're joining us today. Listen, if you're not enjoying your summer, you better hurry. Uh, it's, it's almost over. I want to give a shout out real quick, though, uh, just to all of our kids teams. As you saw on that video, uh, just a lot goes into Makers Camp. And so a shout out to Deanna and Bryn and Mackenzie and Justin and the over 100 volunteers that served all week last week investing in the lives of the next generation. There were over 30 decisions for Jesus. Can we celebrate that this last week? Amen. Listen, uh, a lot goes into it. Children's ministry is not for the faint of heart. But I will say, uh, I can't think of anything greater to invest in than our youth and our children because they, uh, God is doing an amazing work in them. And as we look around the world today, it's easy to get discouraged by what you see. But I believe that God is raising up a generation and the next generation that we're investing in that is not a generation to be on defense, but a generation to go on offense for the kingdom of God. And e we can easily say, oh, no, I feel bad for our kids. No, God put your kids at this time in history to make a difference in the world around them. And we need to pray for them and invest in them. So if, if you're not investing in the next generation, find a way to do it. If you need a place to serve, I know Deanna over here at the north is like, talk to me. I'll holler at you for a little bit. Um, but anyway, we are in a series called Summer at NCC, and it's a series that we always say is not really a series because we have a number of different speakers come in. Some of my friends have spoken. I'm slotting in today, and uh, I just, I love the summer because it, it kind of breaks things up. But how many of you know, with, if you got kids, your schedules get off in the summer? Like nothing is normal. Your routine is off. Your kids' schedule's off. Your schedule's off. And if you go on vacation, it gets even more off, Right? How many of you went on a vacation this summer or wanted to go on a vacation? If you wanted to, you could still raise your hand. But you know how when you get ready to go on a vacation, like that last few days before, when you're at work, like it's, you're not at work. Your mind is somewhere else. You're thinking about everything that's coming. You're excited. You're distracted, right? And then when you come back from vacation for the first few days, you're also distracted. You're still on vacation mentally. And, and I found that it just throws everything off. But I can find that in our culture today, we're easily distracted. How many of you would admit in the house of the Lord today that by show of hands that you are easily distracted? Anybody? Okay. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, thank you for honesty. Some of you wanted to raise your hand, and I could tell you were, that means you're distracted. Uh, we're easily distracted. You know, a lot of times we'll start on something, and it's like squirrel. You know, we're right over here. We're into something else. My uh, middle daughter, Emma, is this way. And I asked her, I don't know where she is. She's in here this service. I asked her if I could tell these stories because Emma is amazing. She tells the greatest stories uh, with the greatest amount of detail that you could ever hope for or want in a story <laughs> down to what kind of shoes people are wearing. I mean, details. The other day I was asking her, I said, Emma, uh, we we're cooking dinner. I said, could you turn the oven on and could you go get me that, a fork? And she's like, got it, Dad. And she starts telling me a story. She's walking away. And not four steps later, she was like, what am I doing again? You know, like, I got distracted with this story, and she forgot. Well, she comes by that a little bit honestly. I've told you this before. My, my wife, uh, she could get a little bit distracted. When we go on dates, uh, I'll sit across from her, and I'm just ready to have some time with her and look into her eyes and pour out my soul to her. And as I'm talking to her, she's like looking around me. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, I'm trying to get in her eyesight. She's like, the people behind you are on a date. I'm trying to figure out how they met. You know, she's just easily <laughs> distracted. I'm like, you're here for me, you know. And she's like, not right now. We're here for them, you know. <laughs> but to her credit, she now sits with her back to everybody else so she can focus on me. So thank you for that, sweetie. I appreciate that. But the reality is I think that we easily get distracted. I want to look at a story in the scripture today that highlights this. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 10, and maybe you've heard this passage before. My guess is you probably have. This is about two sisters uh, in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 38. It says, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was what? Distracted. Come on, say it a little louder. Martha was distracted. 
distracted. I just need to know that you're not distracted. You're paying attention to me. By the big dinner that she was preparing, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. I love this story. There's a lot of insights we can get into it, but I also want to just point out in this moment that oftentimes when we read this passage, Martha gets a bad rep, right? If you've ever heard of Martha in the Bible, it's normally not associated with something positive. We always go to this story, and we're like, don't be a Martha. Have you ever said that before? Don't be a Martha. Well, let's be honest. Whose house was it? You can talk back today. Martha's, right? (laughs) Whose food was it? Martha's, right? Okay, so Martha's not all bad. I mean, we wouldn't be having a get-together if it weren't for Martha. Jesus wouldn't be at the house hanging out with a small group if it weren't for Martha. You want some Martha's on your team at work, right? You want some people who are going to get some stuff done. They're not just going to sit around. They, they get work done. They get some accomplishments done. You need some Martha's. Y'all, y'all think it's a trick. I'm not joking. You need some Martha's. Y'all are like, no, you don't. <laughs> Someone, Martha, raise your hand. Yes. But Martha was distracted is what Jesus said. She was distracted. I don't know about you, but I've been like this before. I've had people over for dinner, and we wanted to spend some time with them, but I got so busy cooking for them and preparing things for them and serving them and making sure that they always had a a full cup. And then at the end of the night, when I said goodbye to them, I was like, man, I really didn't even get to spend any time with them. We were too busy being distracted by everything going on. And I think the burden that the Lord gave me for this is because I believe we live in the most distracted culture maybe in history. It has never been easier to be distracted, stay distracted, or live distracted than it is in this time in history right now. And technology has probably progressed that rapidly. The advent of technology and social media, everywhere we go, there are screens and there are notifications and there's something always vying for our attention that it's very hard to stay focused on something. We're just so easily distracted. I saw this documentary recently called The Social Dilemma. And it's a a documentary about the advent of social media. And many of the creators of social media were on there talking about how when they initially created it, they saw it was a good thing. But for many of these apps, they've backed out of it. And they say, "It's, it's dangerous, the rabbit hole that we're going down. And it's fascinating when you find out what the whole goal of many of these apps is. It's really not to provide a place for you to just have likes and create friends or even find things on Marketplace that you can sell for $5. It's not like that. The whole goal is just to keep you on their app. Like the, all the algorithms are set up to pay attention to what you're searching for, what you're hovering over, what your eyes look at long enough, and they're going to keep feeding you whatever that is so that you stay in their app and go down a rabbit hole of watching cat videos or watching cooking videos or whatever it is, whatever you like. Like if you start looking at government stuff, they're going to stay focused on that, and they're not going to give you everything. They're going to give you what you like. And they just want to keep you in there. In fact, if you notice for many of your social media apps, they don't even show the clock anymore. You don't even know what time it is when you're in the app. You have to exit the app to see how long have I been on this app. Because the whole goal is to keep you distracted and going down a rabbit hole so you ultimately maybe end up in the comments. And let me just tell you, the comments are the Wild West of social media today. If you want to see crazy stuff, just go look at the comments. People are so emboldened in comments. They say things they would never say to your face, especially in Texas, because they would be like, it'd be over anyway. (laughs) That has nothing to do with the message. But the reality is everything is vying for our attention to distract us. And when I looked at what the etymology of the word distraction was, where it came from, it comes from two words, dis and tract, which means apart and to drag, or it literally means to be pulled apart or pulled in different directions. So when you are being distracted, you're literally being pulled in different directions. In fact, it carries with it a word picture of an old way of torture where they would take somebody and they would tie ropes to horses to their arms and their legs and they would send the horses off in different directions. And and the French actually call that the torture of distraction because it's literally distracting. I know that's a, a gruesome picture today, but that is what is happening in our life when we 
are pulled in all of these different directions. We're losing the actual traction that we had in our life. We're losing our focus on the things that truly matter. And I've just found in the world we live in, there is a gravitational pull to distraction. In fact, I would say there's an attraction to distraction. We kind of want to be distracted if we're being honest. And if we're not intentional, if we're not careful, you'll get distracted by things that aren't relevant or really important, and they'll suck your time and your energy and your focus away from the things that deserve your time and your energy and your focus. So I want to talk to you today about distraction, and I want to do it by giving you four distractions that we have to be aware of or careful of. So if you're taking notes today, here is the first one. It is the distraction of comparison. The distraction of comparison. Again, with technology, it is so easy to see what everybody else is doing, what everybody else has, and be distracted by comparing to them. Martha did this, actually. If you noticed in the story, what's the first thing she said? Jesus, isn't it unfair that I'm doing all this work and Mary's doing nothing? Isn't it unfair that I'm working hard and and Mary's being lazy, right? Right? And then her comparison actually led her to want to control Jesus and Mary because she said, make her do something. Tell her to come help me. Now, we may not be that obvious, but I bet you somehow in the back of our minds sometimes as we're looking around, we're going, isn't it unfair, God, that I'm working hard and they're on the vacation I wanted? Isn't it unfair that I'm doing all the right things, but they got the relationship I wanted? They, they got the raise I wanted. God, they're living the life that I wanted. Jesus, do something about it. Make them give me something. Real quiet here at the north again. First service got quiet there too. We just start comparing and we start to chase things that other people have that we don't have. It actually literally starts to pull us in all of these different directions other than the direction that God intended us to be going in. And this is what I found is that when we compare, we chase the irrelevant over the important. We start chasing things that really don't matter in the long run. They really don't even matter in this life. We, we start getting distracted and our attention and our affection goes in other directions. In fact, I read this week that a study showed recently that 12% of our daily thoughts are giving to comparing. And that's self-identified. I bet it's even higher. 12%. That's a lot of thoughts that we're comparing to. Why do they have that? Why don't I get to do that? And I wish I looked like that. And you can just go on and on. It's no wonder that Jesus continually in the scripture tried to remind us of where to set our focus. Matthew 6, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, he says, seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness and all these other things, they'll be added to you. If you'll chase after the kingdom, he's saying, if you'll set your focus on the things that truly matter for eternity, all the other things that you wish you had, I'll take care of those things. I'll make sure your needs are provided for if you'll seek first the kingdom. Again, comparison is a trap, and I don't have time to spend a lot of time on it, but it's a thief of joy. It sucks your focus and your energy and your time, and I bet most of us, if not all of us at some point, even this last week, have compared. It's a distraction. Here's the second distraction, and that's the distraction of entertainment. We live in an entertain-me culture. I want to be entertained all the time. Our culture is so afraid of being bored. We're so afraid of quiet and silence. When I was a kid, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. If, if I told my parents that I was bored, they'd say, good, go outside and figure something to do, you know. I tell kids today, outside was the place where I lived. Inside was a magical place. We got to go to sleep at night, right? <laughs> kids today, it's like outside, the only time they go outside is when they're going to their car or to school or something. But distra- we're just so distracted today. And I I saw this study again this week because I was kind of looking at how how distracted are we really? In 1980, 5% of all Americans had been diagnosed with ADHD. In 2022, 11.5% of just 3 to 17-year-olds had been diagnosed with ADHD. That represents 7 million kids alone just in 2022, and the numbers continue to be on the rise. Why is that so? Because everything is vying for our attention in short spans. We, we can't keep our attention because we're distracted by this message, that message, this app, that social. And so we have no ability to actually focus for long periods of time because we're stimulating our mind constantly. We're, we're actually kind of afraid of letting our mind rest. Pay attention when you leave today. 
when you go driving down the road. People can't be quiet in their car. They have to have music playing, podcasts going. they got to be on a phone call. Or watch when you pull up to a red light how many people are actually on their phone scrolling through reels or TikTok or something like that. Even when they're not at a red light, you can tell because they're starting to swerve back and forth a little bit, right? Just, just start to pay attention. Watch when you go to the grocery store. People can't stand in line at the grocery store and just observe everything going on around them. They gotta, if, the, if the line stops, they got to get their phone out. they got to get on to something else. Watch when you go to the doctor's office in a waiting room. People are always going to, they're, they're going to be on a game. They're going to be watching some video. They're going to be on a, on a conference call. Like I was, met somebody the other day. I didn't meet them, actually. They were just in front of me. They were on speakerphone in public. And I'm hearing this whole conversation, and it, I was like, the lady's like, I can't hear you. And I'm like, ma'am, if you would just do this, you could probably hear better. <laughs> so just a piece of advice. Please don't be on conference calls or, or speakerphone in public places. Keep that to yourself. But we're distracted. We're just easily distracted. I mean, watch your own family. We can't even watch a 30-minute TV show without being on our phone at the same time. I'm guilty of this, too. I am not in any means saying this is just other people. Like, this is me, too. We can't even sit for 30 minutes. Some of you will probably be tempted before this 30 minutes is up to get on something else. But I hope you'll stay with me. But what I found is that we entertain ourselves to distract ourselves from ourselves. Like, we don't want to sit alone quiet enough to hear our own thoughts. Some of us are so addicted to distraction that it can be something sinful or something sinful, but we constantly are trying to make ourselves feel like we're doing something, honestly, because we're avoiding something. We're avoiding dealing with our own thoughts. We're avoiding dealing with the fact that we might be disappointed with where we are in life. We're avoiding dealing, if we, if we get quiet enough to think some thoughts, we might realize that there's a void in our life and we're trying to fill it with something else. That's why we want to be distracted. The question for all of us today is what are, we, what are we avoiding? Are we avoiding our thoughts? Are we avoiding being alone? Because we're, we're just afraid of what it might bring up. So we stay distracted so we don't have to deal with things. And I just lovingly want to tell you today that distraction is a plan of the enemy. We have a spiritual enemy, Satan, who would love to constantly distract you to take your focus off of God, to take your focus off of his plans for your life, to to get you going in a direction that you were never intended to go. I don't know if you've heard this before, but if the enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you. He'll just get your focus everywhere else except for on time with God, time with God's people, and time in his word. If he can get you away from that, Even though you may not think you're being destroyed, you are. It's a distraction. Here's the third distraction that most of us, I think, are more familiar with, and that's the distraction of busyness. We can get just so busy. we're, We're the most productive people in history, but yet the most distracted people in history. We may think we're getting more done, but yet I wonder if we're getting the important things actually done. We're not ever present because we're too busy doing, right? Again, this is another, you probably heard this before as well, but if the enemy can't get in front of you to stop you, he'll get behind you and push you. He'll just make you more busy, fill your schedule with more things. And it's the enemy's plan to get you so going fast that you don't slow down enough to spend time with God. Our schedules are more more full than ever. And everybody I meet, they're like, I'm busy. I'm just busy. People tell me all the time, you must be busy. I'm like, we're all busy. I've never met someone who's like, you know what, I'm bored. No, they're, they're all busy. What are we busy about is the question. See, the enemy wants to get you running in so many directions, getting your kids over here, making sure they're on this team, that team, you're doing this thing for work, and you're hunting and fishing or whatever it is, that you actually are being pulled in all of these different directions. I read this quote this week. I thought it was very powerful, and I believe it to be true. It said, one of the greatest spiritual challenges of this generation isn't belief in God, but distraction from God. I don't think a lot of people, especially in the area we live in today in in East Texas, they don't have a problem believing in God. They're just distracted from God. In John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, it's a great book because we live in a hurried culture that we don't slow down enough to process what God wants us to process. He says, we are distracting ourselves into oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God, depth, or the spirit. We like these. It's just that we're too habitually preoccupied to have any of them show up on our radar. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual. 
and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall, and the fantasy life that they produce than we are in church or the things of God. And I'm not telling you this to beat any of us up. I'm saying this is the world we live in, I believe. And it's the distraction of comparison and entertainment and busyness that are driving us away from God. And before you know it, you'll be destroyed by your distractions. Just like that picture. It's torture. You're being pulled in every direction. You have no inner peace. You have no rest for your soul. Even, even good things can be distractions, right? Right? They're not all bad. I mean, sometimes it's obvious to see the bad ones, but there's even good distractions. Martha wasn't distracted by something bad, was she? No, she was distracted by something good. It's not like she was out there just surfing social media, buried in the comments. It's not like she was watching the Hebrew News Network just fretting about Caesar and what he was going to do and inflation. (laughs) No, she, she was distracted by what she considered to be serving Jesus. And this is the fourth distraction we have to be aware of and careful of, and that's the distraction of ministry. And you probably didn't think that your pastor today would be telling you that ministry can be a distraction, but it can. Ministry is good. I want to make it right off the bat. We're all called to ministry. Every single one of us is called to ministry, the work of the ministry. But if you're not careful, it can become a distraction. You see, Jesus didn't get on to Martha for working. That's where I think sometimes we can get it wrong. We can be like, Jesus was getting on to Martha because she was working. No, that's not true. He didn't get on to Martha for working. Martha was mad at Mary, and Martha was distracted. So Jesus was correcting not, not her actions. He was correcting her attitude and her attention. He was, he was correcting the fact that, hey, you, you might be doing something good, but your focus is off here in this moment. See, it's not that the work was bad. It was the work at the cost of relationship that was bad. She, she was missing out on the relationship that she could have had with Jesus in that moment. See, there is a cost to distraction. There's always a cost to distraction. And the world will tell you the cost to distraction is your productivity. And that's the truth. You won't get as many things done, 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 done if you're distracted. But in this case, that's not what... Jesus was talking about. The cost of distraction isn't productivity, it's presence. Many times we miss out on the presence of God trying to be productive for God. We can be so busy working for Jesus that we neglect being with Jesus. And this is how people get burned out in ministry, by the way. They'll serve, 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 and they'll be doing stuff, and they'll be like, man, I just, I'm tired, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. And what they didn't realize is they were trying to work for Jesus apart from Jesus trying to do something for him instead of working from him. And I can tell you, I've been guilty of this too. I'll get into my time with the Lord in prayer. I'll get into the word. And how how many of you know, every time you try to spend time with God, there is a distraction waiting on you. I I mean, there is a notification that's going to pop up. Someone will show up at your house. I mean, you'll get a phone call. And you can even be distracted by things, again, that are ministry related. Like, I've been in my time with the Lord trying to pray, and I'll get an idea for a message. And I'll go down this train of thought preparing a message, not realizing, no, no, no. I'm not in my time with God for you right now. I'm in my time with God for me right now. And in my desire to be more productive, I can forget that the most productive thing that I can do is just sit at his feet and receive something from him. We can all be in this place. And I found it true that Many times what we're distracted by, whether intentional or unintentional, whether, we, whether it's blatantly bad or not, it's often the pursuit of something that we think will satisfy a need in us. It's the pursuit of something we think that might bring us rest or might make us feel productive. And really, that's why, again, Jesus keeps always trying to, when you read the word, redirect our focus. Look at what he says here in Matthew eleven twenty eight. He says, come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give is light. Jesus is saying, listen, I I understand that you're looking for things to satisfy something deep inside of you, but if you'll listen to me, I've got two focuses for you. There's two focuses right here that Jesus gives in this passage that to fix our distracted hearts. Let me me show you what these two focuses are. The first one he says is come to me. It's a focus on the right person. 
Oftentimes we can go to someone or something else to try to find the soul rest that we're craving. Because deep down inside every one of us, if we're honest, there's a restlessness that can only be satisfied by something Jesus can provide. And much of our distractions are trying to fill that void so we don't have to process it's still there because we haven't gone to Jesus to fill that need. He's saying, come to me. I'm the source that satisfies every desire in your heart. I'm the one that can give you something that the world can't give you. You can sleep all day and still not be rested. I can give you rest for your soul is what he's saying here. You you can see this as a theme throughout the scriptures. Even Psalm 23, what does David say? It's one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What does he do? He restores my soul. I recognize that my soul is not at rest until I'm with God. That's why God said in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Because it's in the stillness and it's in the quiet that we actually can hear his voice, hear his words, and experience his presence when we're constantly distracted, we're wondering, why can't I hear the voice of God? Why am I not experiencing his presence? Because we're too distracted to get still enough and quiet enough to hear his voice. See, I think distraction is destroying our ability to experience his presence. And we keep going to another well instead of the one that Jesus said, come to me. Mary had come to him. Mary was sitting at his feet listening to his words because when you listen to his words or you get into his word you get a fresh revelation continually of who he is that's why the scripture continually points us where to look and where to focus the bible constantly says fix your eyes on jesus don't be distracted by the things in this world set your thoughts on things above don't set your thoughts on things below don't be distracted by everything you see no there is one person we ought to look at That's why the psalmist says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When we are distracted, we take our eyes off of the only one who can help us. And Jesus is saying, come to me and you're going to find rest for your soul. The second focus he gives us is not just focus on the right person. It's focus on the right purpose. That happens in this passage. He's like, yeah, come to me and I'll give you rest, but I'll also give you purpose. Because do you know what a yoke is? A yoke is an instrument for work. When you're yoked to something, like two oxen together, they, were, they would be linked together. It, they would plow a field. They would do work, but they had to go in the same direction and at the same pace. One couldn't just veer off and be like, I'm going to go over here for a little bit. I'm distracted. No, they have to go in the same direction. And what Jesus is inviting us into is not only receiving his rest, but receiving his yoke, which leads us in his direction and gets us working along his purpose. We find rest and we find purpose when we come to him. Take my yoke. Let me teach you. Go at my pace. Go at my direction. And I want to be clear. There is work to be done. I'm not here to say don't do the work. No, we've got to do the work. There's a work of the ministry that we have to do. And when we get his purpose, we'll be so busy about what he wants us to do with the right proper order that we'll, we'll be so busy doing the work of the kingdom that distractions will not bring us down from that. We, we have a work to do. We have time on this earth that is limited. So I don't want to make it unclear here. We still have work. I thought about Nehemiah this week. If you've ever read the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, Nehemiah had a burden from God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he's rebuilding these walls, and these distractions show up. Two people in the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. And they're like, hey, come down off that wall. We want to talk to you. They didn't want him to finish the work. But he knew what he was doing, and he said, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. And I believe God wants us all to be so focused on what he's doing and wanting us to do in our lives that we won't be distracted by people trying to get us off of our purpose, that we can say, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I'm not going to focus on the irrelevant so that I can focus on the important. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care what they're wearing. I don't care what the baseball team wants me to do. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. That is the goal of doing the work of the ministry. But we have to get the order right. And that's what Jesus was trying to say. Come to me and find rest. Then you'll find work. That's what Mary understood. Mary was sitting at his feet. She understood that worship precedes the work. That if you're going to do the work for Jesus, you have to first spend time worshiping him. Being with Jesus precedes doing for Jesus. 
Again, this is why people get so burned out or off track as they get so busy doing things for him that they neglect to be with him. And I want to make it clear, Mary wasn't lazy. It wasn't like Martha was the worker and Mary was the lazy one. That's what we often think, right? But Mary wasn't lazy. Mary just knew her source. Mary knew that if Jesus was in the room, nothing else was going to matter. Mary knew that who you give your attention to will define who you become. And she had seen his worth. We know she had seen his worth. In fact, Jesus highlights that in Luke chapter 10, verse 39. Look, we read this earlier. Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. And then in verse 42, he says, there is only one thing Jesus said worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. And no one can take that away from Mary. What had Mary discovered? She had discovered who he was. She had discovered his worth. She had discovered the value of sitting and listening to his word. She was devoted to Jesus. She would prove it. Later, we would see Mary coming into an area, we talked about this at the beginning of the year, where she was not welcome, breaking open an alabaster jar of expensive perfume and pouring it out on his feet. And we know that Mary worked because that was worth a year's wages that she had saved up. It wasn't that she wasn't a hard worker. It's that she knew the value of being with Jesus. She knew his worth and she was willing to give it all and pour it out on him at any moment because he was worth it. She had a revelation of who Jesus was. Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was. When he said, you are the Christ, you're the son of the living God. Later, Peter would say, where else would we go? You have the words of life. It all, being with Jesus always has to proceed doing for Jesus. And what I, my burden for us today was that we would come to understand today That the way that we don't stay distracted is we learn to live devoted to Jesus. You can move from distracted to devoted when you have a revelation of who he is. When you see his worth. When you understand what he has done for you. When you understand that everything that, that you need comes from him. That he's the very source of life. That he has the very words of life. That rest for your soul. That void inside of you that we're trying to fill by keeping our mind distracted. It is only satisfied when we stop long enough to focus on the beauty and the holiness of who he is and receive what he has for us. That's my burden for you. Because let me just be honest with you. We've we've got a short time on this earth. We got work to do. We got people to reach. But we can't do it distracted. We can do it devoted in the proper order. How many of you would say maybe today, I I don't want to live my life distracted. I want to live my life devoted to Jesus. How many of you would say that? Would anybody, if you would, would you just stand with me? And I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And I know maybe this has been a different message than you thought you'd get today. Or maybe there were some areas where it's like, I don't don't know if that's me or not. Well, I'm not the one that can tell you that, but the Holy Spirit is. And so I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want you to take a minute and you just ask the Lord, God, show me any area of my life that I might be distracted in. So if you would, just bow your heads with me. And This is what we like to do here often. We say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? Lord, I pray in this moment you'd begin to reveal to us, God, areas maybe of our life where we've been distracted, God. If, there, if, if we've been distracted because we're avoiding dealing with something inside of us, God, I pray today you'd give us the courage to confront those things, God. You give us the courage to bring them to you, God, and to receive what only you can give us, and that is peace and hope and joy and purpose in our life, God. I pray right now, Lord, you'd reveal to us any area, God, where we've gotten out of alignment with your will or your purpose, God, any area where we're, we've gotten distracted, Lord. Maybe there's something that the Lord is going to speak to you that, that's been a distraction. He's asking you to get away from, to put down, to walk away from, to disconnect from so that you can reconnect to him. I don't know what those areas are, but the Holy Spirit does. And by his gentle, loving voice, he'll correct that. He'll bring you back into alignment. And God, we just say, I say, Lord, God, if I've been distracted in any areas, forgive me. God, I want you to have my whole heart, Lord. I want to be fully devoted to you, God. I want to fulfill everything that you have called me to do on this earth, God. I want to have a deep, meaningful, fulfilling relationship with you, God. And from that place, God, make a difference in the world around me. God, I just pray that would be all of our prayer today, God. We just make the declaration today, God, we are yours. We pour out our love on you, God. We sit at your feet today and receive from you, God. Speak to us what you want to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's worship.